this is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Protesters and far-right lawmakers stormed two army bases in Israel as tensions soar over the arrests of soldiers accused of abusing a Palestinian prisoner. Venezuelans take to the streets of Caracas to protest the nation's election result as the opposition says it has proof it defeated President Nicolas Maduro. And Asian shares slip with traders trimming some holdings ahead of key earnings, economic data and central bank meetings. The dollar creeping higher ahead of the Fed's rate call. It's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Brissachi over here in Dubai. Uh, lots to talk about, uh, including some of the regional developments. But as ever, let's get a check on how markets have fared. A bit of a moderate close to Wall Street yesterday. But as you can see today, uh, we are getting a mixed picture. S&P futures are tilted towards the red, down about a quarter of a percent as we slip below 5,500. Nasdaq pointed towards the green. All eyes on Microsoft earnings today as we start to pick up momentum. $15 trillion worth of market cap is reporting the S&P this week. So lots to get through, and it's only Tuesday. That in addition to the central bank meetings, the Bank of Japan beginning its two-day meeting today, Fed as well, uh, and then also we speak about the Bank of England on Thursday too. So still a lot to get through this week. Ten-year yields are down about three basis points on the session yesterday. What's interesting about the ten-year yield is even though it feels as though we've been moving lower and lower, we're actually unchanged versus where we were a week ago. Remember, we had that uptick last Monday. So it, it's been a steady grind lower in terms of uh, the 10-year yield. But the market is still pricing at about 66 basis points worth of cuts for the end of the year. Brent, keep an eye on what's been happening there. We are through $80 once more. Key level, psychological level, down half a percentage point again. Some people are saying it's technicals. We've broken through 50-day, 100-day, 200-day moving average. But then also keep an eye on some of the fundamentals and the weakness in demand coming through from China. Our terminal chart today, well, I mentioned the Bank of Japan. I thought it would be uh, just interesting to give some context here. Uh, traders are bracing themselves from, from big yen moves. And, of course, we have moved a long way already just in the last couple of weeks. 4% firmer versus the USD. But this just tells you that implied volatility, i.e. markets, are bracing themselves for a lot of movement either way once that decision comes through tomorrow. So we're going to talk more, obviously, about uh, what the market is expecting for this Bank of Japan meeting. But for the time being, Let's check in on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril is in our Singapore studio, and it's not all about the Bank of Japan, Avril. <laughs> Yeah, it's also about the Fed. And as you say, it could go both ways when you look at dollar yen. A lot of volatility expected, but consensus is for a hawkish BOJ with a dovish Fed all in. This could turn into a double whammy of policy news, and that could really shake the currency either way. So you're seeing actually on dollar yen now, it's pairing some of the gains from earlier in the week, hovering near the 154 level. It was sitting almost 153 just a day ago, and ahead of all that, as well. Don't forget, we've got those tech earnings. we got China PMI's Australia inflation data out tomorrow. There's a lot of uh, risk off in the region, and the Hang Seng is leading declines. Japanese equities also down. Jumana. Mm. A day in the red then. Avril, thank you so much for the latest. All right, uh, back to some of the regional news. Protesters and lawmakers from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition have stormed two Israeli army bases after the arrest of soldiers accused of abusing a Palestinian prisoner. Managing editor for Middle East and North Africa, Honor Ant, joins us now. Uh, some Israeli outlets are calling this a, a day of chaos. Just walk us through the developments. What happened last night in Israel? Sure, Jumana. What happened last night in Israel was quite unpredictable, if not outright shocking. Uh, the fact that uh, quite a few group, uh, quite a few people uh, broadly can be described as conservatives or far right nationalists uh, stormed two army bases or tried to break into two army bases overnight in protest of uh, the arrest of Israeli reservists earlier on Monday, who were uh, arrested by what appear to be military police, judging by the footage, because of uh, an alleged abuse of an Israeli, uh, of a Palestinian prisoner uh, in, in Israeli prisons. Uh, this, was, this was quite unexpected because Israeli military is still a very sacred and trustworthy institution uh, uh, for, for much of the society, and especially so during the wartime. So it was pretty much unthinkable for people to try to break into uh, army bases uh, as a protest. And we've immediately seen reaction from uh, various lawmakers and other institutions in Israel condemning the move. Yet on the other hand, 
there were uh, far-right uh, nationalist lawmakers, such as the uh, Israel's National Security Minister, Tamar bin Gwir, who, who had earlier um, lambasted uh, uh, institutions for basically arresting Israeli reservists uh, over, uh, over the alleged abuse of a Palestinian prison. Mm. All of this uh, taking place at a time when many had been expecting a reprisal on the northern border, uh, Lebanon bracing itself for a possible reprisal coming out of Israel after the Golan Heights attacks, and yet it seems as though uh, attention had to be focused domestically. What's the knock-on implication for what this might mean for Israel's uh, retaliation against the Golan Heights attack? Yeah, clearly what happened over the last 24 hours in Israel, I think, is a sign of how much uh, the population, at least part of the population, feels on edge over what's happening both in the south and the north of the country. As you said, over the weekend, there was this uh, attack on a football field uh, in Israeli-occupied Golden Heights, which resulted in the death of 12 young people, uh, mostly children. And that resulted, obviously, in a huge uh, backlash in Israel, and uh, officials, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, have been promising harsh response which is obviously not really unexpected in a situation like this and also very much in line with what we have seen so far during the conflict since the war in Gaza began in October last year. What is different this time is that uh, unlike previous significant attacks by uh, what well, uh, blamed on uh, uh, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, this time around Israeli officials have been carefully telling I think, the rest of the world and also their domestic uh, audience is that there is going to be a response and they say it's going to be harsh, but they're making it very clear that this time around it's likely to be a limited but significant operation that will send a signal to Hezbollah on the one mm. hand, but will somewhat avoid the risk of a full, uh, full-blown uh, war with Hezbollah, which many Israelis uh, believe the government may not be able to afford while conducting another war in the yeah. south against Hamas and Gaza. Yeah. Uh, Honor, I'm going to leave it there, but it segues nicely into our next guest. Uh, that was Honor, Managing Editor from Middle East and North Africa. Honor, and uh, let's bring in Neve McBurney, Associate Director at Control Risk Middle East. Uh, we, we ended the conversation with the owner there saying that uh, the, the latest out of Israel seems to suggest that a reprisal is forthcoming, but that, that it would be, and this is a quote, limited yet significant mm -hmm. in response. Uh, what do you think? What do you think is going to end up happening in, in the Lebanon reprisal? That reflects our analysis, and that reflects our analysis that we've had ongoing for a while, that um, what we're going to see, uh, and even with the terrible circumstances of the weekend, what we're likely to see over the next coming weeks and potentially months is a, is, um, a series of, of uh, deeper... Um, uh, more aggressive engagements, mildly escalatory over time, um, but nothing necessarily big, sudden, um, marking the beginning of an all-out conflict. We think it's much more, more gradual than that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think Prime Minister Netanyahu's calculus is over here? Because, you know, they are... He, he's being pushed by many right-wing members of his cabinet mm -hmm. to, to uh, launch a retaliation or response to the Golan Heights attacks. But at the same time, the war in Gaza has been going on since October. Mm -hmm. uh, economically, there's been a huge impact. There are many stories about uh, the dwindling number of reservists in the army. And so it doesn't feel as though Israel has the ability right now to engage in another full-out war mm -hmm. on another border. So what is his calculus, do you think? Well, I mean, the, uh, your point of all-out war there, or, or, or kind of a full-blown war, kind of points to, to the, you know, owners and, and mine argument that we're, we're going to see um, more occasional um, uh, deeper instances because they maybe don't have the, the capacity to engage in something bigger, although that obviously affects them strategically. There are really big questions about um, political stability in Lebanon with the mm. events of, of yesterday, mm. also um, authority within the IDF um, and institutional capacity and authority within that and the relationship, um, you know, civil military relations, the relationship between the police and, and military and able to, to secure uh, Israel domestically, which is, is a really big concern for yeah. Netanyahu. Uh, on the other side, uh, post July 2006 war, mm -hmm. a, a UN resolution was uh, put in place called Resolution 1701. Yes. And on back of that 
that resolution. Many people don't know about this, but um, it, it, it basically stated that Hezbollah would have to move away from the border to retreat north of the Daytani River. Mm. It has not been implemented because mm -hmm. Hezbollah is still very much present on the southern Lebanese border. And yet I thought it was interesting. The Lebanese prime minister was saying this resolution, mm. the time has come mm. for it actually to be implemented. Do you think that that is going to take place and that Lebanon will be successful at pulling Hezbollah away from the border because mm. clearly that is what Israel would like to see as well. That's definitely a solid de-escalatory step that when we get to that stage could be, I mean, both very powerful for, for Hezbollah to show its different stance to the Lebanese as well as to signal to Israel, look, we're done and we're finally abiding with 1701. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think we're some way away from Hezbollah feeling it is in a position to, but also the Israelis feeling they're in a position to, to end this militarily. Yeah, um, you know, we're just going to keep an eye on, on what happens after that limited but harsh uh, strike that they mm -hmm. talk of. How do you think the overall Gaza ceasefire discussions are going to impact what happens on, on this other border? They are a component, but they're a relatively small component. They're, they're happening in the background, they're ongoing. They're, the talks in Rome that we've had over the last couple of days haven't been positive, which is unfortunate, but it's important to remember they are continuing, which is great. Um, but I think um, it's going to get to the stage for, for Israel where they'll probably have to engage in um, something uh, greater with Lebanon because this is an increasing threat. Mm. We've been talking about this for the last really kind of two months now. Mm. Um, they're going to have to act uh, to be seen to be acting um, to counter that threat regardless really of what's happening in mm. Gaza. And yet if you think about it from say the other perspective, if you think of Hamas being one of Iran's allies in the mm -hmm. region, Hezbollah obviously another proxy from their perspective if that true deal is, a, is, is is agreed to say even if it's just a, a short-term ceasefire mm -hmm. six weeks true deal what is their imperative to keep another war going on another front? Why would they all not adhere to a six-week truce? Well, I think that raises an excellent question. And if we get to that point, and there is, I mean, there is a slight difference between a truce and a ceasefire, but if mm. we got to a legal ceasefire, um, that would actually be a great moment for Hezbollah to be able to de-escalate um, whether Israel would seek to, um, because we do think that Israel are being the more escalatory actor in general with regard to Lebanon um, is still a question, but it would be a good opportunity for that. But again, we still need to get to that point of uh, yeah, ceasefire. Still a lot of stumbling blocks and Indeed. the diplomats are trying to get it over the line. Let's yeah. see how it works out. Neve, thank you so much for joining us today. Neve McBurney, Associate Director at Control Risk Middle East. Thank you. Still ahead, Venezuela's opposition says it has proof that its candidate did win Sunday's election and not President Nicolas Maduro. More details later in the hour. But first, hear why AMP expects the Fed to hold rates steady this week, even as inflation heads back towards target levels. We'll talk market strategy next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Persecci in Dubai. Investors begin the week awaiting answers from major central banks after conflicting signals upended markets. The Bank of Japan and the Federal Reserve will make their calls on Wednesday, followed by the Bank of England on Thursday. Let's bring in Shane Oliver, Chief Economist and Head of Investment Strategy at AMP. A big central bank week, big earnings week as well, but maybe let's just start with the central banks and uh, the hikers. So, so Bank of Japan, the expectation is that we are probably going to get a hike out of the Bank of Japan tomorrow, maybe the beginning of quantity of easing. Certainly markets are beginning to reflect that probability. What is your call? What are you expecting out of the BOJ tomorrow? Look, I must admit the BOJ is a close call. I think we're almost certainly going to get details in terms of quantitative tightening uh, the, or, or a slowing in quantitative easing at least. Um, that's for sure. Uh, the debate is about whether we'll get a rate hike or not. I, I sort of lean to the view that we probably will get a rate hike. Um, I suspect 10 to 15 basis points. Again, I think that's why the uh, the Nikkei index is is well off its highs. Uh, market started to factor that in. Um, but I think the BOJ again will say that it's going to be a, a long process. That uh, you know they can argue that inflation is around the target. Um, but it's not decisively so. Wages growth is still a bit on the soft side and the Japanese economy, economic indicators there are a bit mixed. So I don't expect to, this to be a hawkish tightening. I think it will be a more cautious tightening. 
Uh, yes, more on the way, but don't expect uh, big rises in Japanese interest rates going forward. Mm. Uh, let me turn to the other major central bank decision this week. Nobody's expecting the Fed to cut interest rates now, but certainly perhaps to lay the foundation for a September cut. 66 basis points priced in for the year, so possibly even November as well. Uh, Shane, you write yeah. in your research that you think that the risk of recession in the U.S. is growing. Do you think the Fed are behind the curve? Well, that, that is the risk in all of this, and they have to allow for that possibility. Uh, up until recently, all of their focus has been on inflation. But we have started to see um, not so much people in the Fed, but people who were formerly at the Fed getting more concerned about it. Um, most notably, uh, well, recently, um, D Bill Dudley, who was the uh, president of New York, the New York Fed. Um, I mean, that's the third most senior position at the Fed. He he's a fairly balanced economist. Uh, if he's starting to get a little bit of concern that the Fed might be falling behind the curve, then I think you should take notice of that. And I suspect that there are more, more uh, decision makers at the Fed who are sort of gradually coming round to that view. Uh, it mainly flows from the very weak um, forward-looking labour market indicators we're seeing in the US, big falls in job openings. We get an update on that uh, uh, fairly soon. Uh, quits. Um, and indeed job placements, all those sorts of things are, are, show, are showing a decline. Now, historically, you can see a situation where job vacancies go down in response to weaker labour market demand. I think that's what's been happening, um, but it just shows up in lower vacancies rather than higher unemployment. Now, I think the risk is that as vacancies or openings continue to fall, that you will see more decisive increases in unemployment. And that would obviously pose a risk for the Fed because the rise in unemployment is already quite significant and on some rules is getting close to the point where maybe it starts to confirm a recession. So there's still a fair way to go in all of that. I don't think the Fed mm. will be in a comfortable enough to cut uh, this week, um, but I do think they will set us up yeah. for a cut in September. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels as though the, the world is going to look a little different in the next couple of months, especially because many of those global economic growth indicators have started to turn south. You have the beginning of the rate cutting cycle imminent uh, out of the Fed, the Bank of England, ECB yeah. have already started, Bank of Canada have already started. What does this global easing cycle look like? Well, I, I think it's gradual at first. It, it may accelerate as time goes by and central banks realise that they're dealing with weaker growth and not just lower inflation. Uh, so far, in our base case, is that it's going to be relatively benign, so relatively gradual, uh, at least initially. But, um, you know, we will see more central banks kicking in. I think by the time we get to October, we will have seen all of the major central banks, perhaps excluding the one uh, in Australia, um, starting to cut rates. Um, uh, we've already said, as you say, Europe, Canada, you could add Sweden, Switzerland have already started to cut. This week we could see the UK. Um, in a couple of months we'll see the US. Uh, New Zealand will start to kick in in terms of developed country markets and then Australia probably not till early next year. But we are going into an easing cycle. We've already seen uh, many emerging country central banks start to cut rates. So the environment is, is becoming very different to what you saw, say, two years ago when central banks were all moving towards tightening. Now it looks like a concerted, uh, I wouldn't say coordinated because it's not coordinated, but concerted um, easing cycle kicking off. Now, ultimately, that should be positive for shares yeah. unless you get a recession. If you get a recession, then you're going to need lots more rate cuts. Um, yeah. But if it's the hope for soft landing, then it will be positive for shares. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly keeping an eye, a close eye on what it, this all means for these uh, global markets. Shane, thank you so much for joining us today. Shane Oliver, Chief Economist and Head of Investment Strategy at AMP. Thank you. Well, speaking of shares, I just want to bring you some earnings that have come through from Standard Chartered. Uh, so let me just bring you the highlights here. It is a beat. So the second quarter adjusted pre-tax profits is coming at $1.83 billion, uh, blasting through expectations of $1.62 billion. Uh, of course, uh, being as it is uh, quite levered and exposed to net interest income, interesting to see that their guidance for net interest income is 10 to $10.25 billion 
for 2024. They've also announced a one and a half billion dollar buyback. Uh, so that is uh, one of the other key takeaways that we are getting. In terms of uh, other commentary, the CET1 ratio has come in at a healthy 14.6 percent versus ex estimates of 14 percent. Uh, they will be offering an interim dividend uh, for the shareholders at nine cents. Guidance for income growth for next year is to be above seven percent. Uh, this year is 2024. And uh, in terms of other commentary as well, they're seeing a full-year positive income to cost draws ex-bank levy. That's always an important metric that bank analysts watch out for. You want that positive jaws number, i.e. you want the growth on the revenue to be bigger than the growth that you're seeing on the cost base. So that is a positive guidance coming through from Standard Chartered. But the main takeaway is a beat on the bottom line and that $1.5 billion buyback. And Standard Chartered CEO will be joining Daybreak Europe uh, exclusively next hour. That is at 9.30 a.m. Dubai time. Bill Winters will be speaking to Tom McKenzie. All right, coming up, well, all eyes are on the world's major central banks this week as investors await answers on rate decisions from policymakers in Japan, the U.S. and the U.K. More on what to expect next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Joanna Bersecchi in Dubai. Franklin Templeton is launching seven feeder funds in the UAE targeted at retail investors. It joins asset managers, including Alliance Global Investors, in aligning product offerings with new regulations which ban foreign funds from being promoted to retail investors. Franklin Templeton's feeder funds will be distributed in the UAE by locally licensed promoters, including onshore, conventional and Sharia compliant consumer banks. Newcastle United is now valued at over $1.3 billion after its Saudi owners increased their holdings. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund bought an 80% stake in the Premier League team in October 2021. And sources say the PIF has now acquired former owner Amanda Stavely's stake. The current valuation puts the club roughly on par with seven-time European champions AC Milan. And Japan remains at the top of the medal tally at the Paris Olympic Games with six gold, two silver and four bronze. The Japanese men's gymnastics team surged ahead of rival China in the final stages of the competition. Host nation France is in second spot on the table. China, Australia and Korea round out the top five. It's also coming up, protests in Venezuela following President Maduro's contested election victory. The opposition now say they have proof of what exactly happened during Sunday's vote. All the details next. This is Bloomberg. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Protesters and far-right lawmakers storm two army bases in Israel as tensions soar over the arrests of soldiers accused of abusing a Palestinian prisoner. Venezuelans take to the streets of Caracas to protest the nation's election results as the opposition says it has proof it defeated President Nicolas Maduro. And Asian shares slip, with traders trimming some holdings ahead of key earnings, economic data and central bank meetings. The dollar creeping higher ahead of the Fed's rate call. It's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Versace over here in Dubai. Well, we got a moderately positive close for Wall Street yesterday with both the S&P and the Nasdaq inching higher. Today, a bit of a mixed bag. We've got the S&P seen uh, opening slightly in the red, down about a tenth of a percent, still below 5,500. The Nasdaq inching to towards the green, up about two-tenths of a percent. Today, we're watching out for a, a big number of earnings coming through. But uh, on the slate for uh, the tech earnings, we've got Microsoft. So that's always going to be a big driver of uh, how much sentiment, uh, at, well, well, for buoying sentiment, given how much of a decline we've witnessed in the Nasdaq over the past week. At U.S. Treasuries, we are sitting basically flat at around 4.17. We've rallied three basis points, but over the course of the week, still flat versus where we were about 10 days ago.
ago. And then Brent slipping below $80 this morning. Some downward pressure coming through. Some people pointing towards technicals. Some key levels broken through on the 100-day moving average, 200-day moving average. But others are pointing to fundamentals and the fact that demand out of China hasn't panned out as many of the oil bulls had been hoping for. Switching over, I also just want to draw your attention to uh, investor expectations around this upcoming Bank of Japan meeting. Uh, and of course, uh, the economist community are expecting an interest rate hike in the beginning of quantitative tightening. But as far as investors are concerned, implied volatility is inching higher and higher. So you can see that overnight implied volatility is sitting at a close to uh, high for the year, for 2024, as investors uh, account for the possibility of some big yen moves around the decision tomorrow. Let's check in also on how other markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Avril. Yeah, Jamana, we're taking a closer look at what we're seeing in Japan. A lot of scrutiny on the BOJ governor as he comes through with this decision tomorrow. The analysts that we've been speaking to have already been saying markets might be getting ahead of themselves in expecting both the BOJ to hike rates as well as quantitative tightening at the same time. Regardless, we're going to wait to hear its more detailed plan on the reduction of bond purchases. Most see this hum happening over one to two year period. Our colleagues in the Bloomberg newsroom have been lo looking at the data a bit more closely and they see the reduction in bond purchases coming through on the longer end of things, maybe seven to ten years, because that's where most of the BOJ holdings are. Ahead of all that, we're seeing Japanese equities down, the yen giving up some gains, losing ground above the 155 for now against the greenback and Japanese bonds catching a bit of a bit, Jumana. Avril, thank you so much. Well, we've been tracking closely some of the auto numbers that have been coming through in the last week. And for the most part, they have been disappointing to the downside. We're just getting some numbers through from Toyota as well also at uh, quite negative figures. So global sales for Toyota fell 5.8% year on year, selling at just over 912,000 units in June. June global production was also down 11.8% year on year to 894,000 units thereabout. Global sales falling 4.7% year on year, global production declining 9.8% year on year. And what's interesting to note here is that global Global sales and output have fallen in the first half due to some of those declines in Japan and China, cancelling out uh, the fact that hybrids are doing quite well in North America. So weakness in Toyota is coming through from Japan and China, despite the fact that hybrid sales grew 57.2% to a record 473,000 units during the period in North America. So North America strength, Japan and China weakness coming through from Toyota. All right, elsewhere, it is a big week for central banks with the Federal Reserve and Bank of Japan decisions coming on Wednesday. And the day after that, we'll get the Bank of England's call. But the yen's stunning rally last week makes the BOJ a potential wild card this week. For more on this, let's bring in Garfield Reynolds, who leads our Markets Live Asia coverage. Uh, Garfield, uh, thanks for joining us on the show. Keeping a close eye on the developments in the yen here. And I I'm just wondering how much of a hawkish Bank of Japan decision is already factored into the yen. Perhaps investors will be disappointed. Well, there certainly is a chance that investors will you know, end up selling the yen if uh, Governor Ueda once more is seen you know, disappointing. The difficulty is that it's a very hard central bank meeting to read because they're looking at not only a possible rate hike but also you're starting down the road towards seriously reducing bond purchases and even eventually tri you're starting to reduce the massive holdings that they have in Japanese government bonds. So there are so many moving parts there and that's why you've got that extraordinary volatility that you were pointing to earlier in the program. You could get an outcome where they don't hike rates, but it still ends up being seen as hawkish if they start very strongly to move ahead towards reducing their bond holdings. So, and that would send Japanese yields rising. That could set off gains in, in the yen, as you can hear. A lot of could-haves there, but the market is also, yeah. it's kind of positioned for a, we think they're going to be hawkish, but they'll probably disappoint. So if they don't disappoint, you could get some very strong moves. Yeah, you know, and that being said, even though 
uh, let's say the Bank of Japan do end up hiking interest rates and the Fed end up cutting interest rates in September, you're still talking about a five percentage point differential between Japanese rates and U.S. rates. How much support would a Bank of Japan rate hike actually offer to the currency? Well, I could offer a fair bit of support because it is near historically weak levels. There's also the, the dynamics for the markets. And that's why I was saying you know, the pace of change that the BOJ outlines can matter a lot more than what they actually do at the meeting. Similarly for the Fed, you know, how open Jerome Powell uh, sounds to you know, multiple rate cuts rather than you know, cut and then wait to see what happens. If the markets see you know, a dynamic shift going on between the two central banks, that's what would set off you know, some severe yen strength. By the same token, you could get the Bank of Japan hikes rates, but is cautious about bond sales. You could get Powell saying, like I said, we're going to cut, we think, but then we'll probably wait and nobody should expect us to cut, cut, cut. You could then yeah. get, ironically, what looks like the expected result from the two central banks, but the markets could go in completely the opposite direction to what everybody was expecting them to as you went in. Yeah. What is your view uh, as to how those carry trades, not, not just the, in the yen, but other currencies in the, in the region, how those are going to play out in the next couple of months? Because we've seen a bit of a positioning shakeout. Is this just a blip or is this a, a new theme for investors? It is potentially you know, a, a serious sustained theme. We did have uh, a big reduction in yen shorts. Some of that was to do with the carry trades. Uh, you know, there's also been some reduction, for example, in carry trades for the Chinese currency. But overwhelmingly, that, those are still very strongly held positions. You were talking about that 5% rate differential. That's why you know, it makes sense to, to borrow in yuan, to borrow in yen, to borrow in some of these other low yielding currencies and to invest in US dollars, uh, you know, in Australian dollars or in even higher yielding currencies like the Mexican peso. So if we get a continuation of a shift higher in Japanese rates, if we also get a shift higher in rates for uh, the Chinese yuan, at least in the, in the currency space, that could have an impact. It just it, it adds that extra layer of volatility if you get what looks like a sustained turnaround in the direction of those currencies which have been shorted as part of those currency trades. Even after what was a very, very strong shakeout over the last couple of weeks for the yen and others, those carry trades are still at historically high levels and therefore, you know, that's why you've got the potential for some strong you know, reversals for s some of the ways that currency have been moving this year, uh, in particular, you know, if we, what plays into this too, again, with the Fed. If the Fed signals it's yeah. going to march lower with its rate and you get the dollar dropping with momentum, that threatens to upset a lot of carry trade apple carts out there. Yeah, and it seems like what you're saying is there's still there's still plenty of positioning in those types of trades. So something to watch out for. Garfield, thank you for putting it on our radar. Garfield Reynolds, Bloomberg's Market Life Asia team leader. Thank you. Well, thousands of Venezuelans uh, are taking to the streets of Caracas in protest after President Nicolas Maduro claimed victory in Sunday's vote. Venezuela's opposition campaign says it can prove that Edmundo González won the election. This comes after the country's public prosecutor named González a suspect in an alleged plot to sabotage the election. Es un milagro. Es un milagro. Pero hoy... Today... I want to tell all Venezuelans in the country and abroad, to all the Democrats of the world, we now have proof of the truth of what happened yesterday in Venezuela. All right, let's talk more about this uh, very uh, important story in Venezuela. Uh, let's bring in Bloomberg senior editor Bill Ferries, who joins us now. A really fascinating turn of events in the last 24 hours, because on Sunday evening, it looked as though this was going to be a shoe in for the opposition party. But of course, exactly 24 hours ago, uh, the Venezuelan agency called it for Maduro. Now the opposition are saying that they have enough proof of fraud. 
how is this different from previous elections in which the opposition also claimed fraud? Right. Uh, pretty much every election that's taken place under uh, the Chavez and Maduro regimes over the last 25 years have been tainted by accusations of fraud. But this time the opposition is coming forward and they're saying they have details from about 70 percent of the polling stations that show uh, their candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, winning more than twice as many votes as Nicolas Maduro. So we haven't seen that information publicly. Uh, the opposition has called for uh, families to gather at 11 a.m. Uh, Venezuela time on Tuesday, uh, where presumably some of this information may start to be made public. Uh, but that's, uh, that's one big key difference. The other is that some of Venezuela's traditional allies, talking about uh, countries like Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, they have kind of held off so far on congratulating Maduro on this win. They've said that they need to see some of that mm. polling data. So Venezuela is looking at a situation where it's a little more isolated internationally than it's been in previous elections. I mean, how likely is it that the Maduro regime actually accepts that proof, assuming that the opposition party provided it? Uh, they, they can't be forced to step down. So w what happens in the coming days? No, it's very unlikely. The Maduro government and uh, the Hugo Chavez government before that have a long history of uh, going after political opponents, of jailing opponents, of disqualifying them. Maria Corina Machado, who was really the opposition leader in Venezuela, she herself was disqualified from taking part in this election, and uh, over a hundred of her supporters and allies were arrested. So it's very unlikely the Maduro government would go quietly. It just remains to be seen how much public pressure can be put upon them and what the international community does in the coming hours and days. Yeah. Uh, we'll keep a close eye on it. Bill, thank you so much for the latest. That was uh, Bloomberg's senior editor, Bill Ferries. Also coming up on our show, the IMF approves a $3.4 billion funding program for Ethiopia. We are live in the capital, Addis Ababa, next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. The U.S. is backing the early extension of a trade pact with Africa, which was due to lapse next year. The AGOA trade pact will allow more than 30 sub-Saharan African nations to retain their duty-free access to the world's largest economy. America's trade concessions have in part been directed at countering Russia and China's influence on the continent. And the IMF has agreed to lend Ethiopia $3.4 billion over four years as part of an economic reform program, a key step to begin negotiations with creditors on restructuring the nation's debt. The decision also includes the immediate disbursement of about $1 billion from the fund. For more on this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Fasika Taresi, who joins me from Addis Ababa. Uh, Fasika, about 24 hours ago, uh, we uh, just reported that Ethiopia had taken the decision to move towards a floating rate regime. Clearly now we understand in retrospect that that was the first signal that the agreement with IMF was going to pass. But first of all, just give us context for why that move towards a floating rate regime is significant. Uh, thanks so much. So Ethiopia <clears throat> had uh, managed uh, floating system for the past more than three decades so that the Central Bank of Ethiopia has been setting uh, the exchange rate for banks and has been issuing a daily uh, exchange rates for banks that they can use to sell and buy foreign currency. So that was the, the region that Ethiopia has been going through. So this strict uh, currency control has brought or has led to a critical foreign currency crunch in the country, uh, deterring investments and prompting companies uh, to exit Ethiopia due to difficulties to repatriate the profits they make from from the country. So there, there were also so many challenges in the country because of the forex crunch, like business business were uh, struggling to uh, secure foreign currency uh, to import their raw materials. And uh, the country has been also uh, yeah. facing challenges getting uh, foreign currency to, to buy or to acquire major commodities like fuel, medicine, and uh, basic uh, commodities. So that was, uh, that also contributed uh, yeah. the contribution 
in the reserves of the country. So that was the broader uh, challenge the country has been yeah. facing while having uh, a, managed float, uh, a managed floating foreign currency regime. So, yeah. uh, so now uh, the government moved to uh, floating the foreign currency to be uh, the the foreign exchange the foreign exchange to be uh, determined by the market. So that's uh, uh, yeah. Banks. Fasika, let me um, let me yeah let me just ask you uh, you know the, what is the significance for Ethiopia of of having secured this IMF program now? Why does it matter so much for the economy? Um, so the economy, as I mentioned before, the economy has been going through uh, different challenges, which the government called the structural problems. Uh, so they, the, the, the country has about $28 billion external debts. There was a um, challenge to, uh, to service that debt. There was an uh, imbalance in the economy. There was a severe forex crunch in the country. So this will help the country to alleviate this challenge, the balance of payment, and also to somehow alleviate the severe forex crunch that the country has been uh, facing. Mm. Bloomberg's Fasika Taresi in Addis Ababa. Thank you so much uh, for the overview of uh, what's been happening in Ethiopia. Uh, very important uh, steps in the last 24 hours. And speaking of other uh, countries that have floated their currencies in the last few months, uh, Egypt's completed a much anticipated review of its expanded IMF program, unlocking $820 million in support for an economy emerging from its worst crisis in decades. The IMF deal, along with a large UAE investment, are the cornerstones of a massive global bailout offering Egypt an economic lifeline. And coming up, hold on to your lucky charms because the UAE is about to get its very first official lottery. We've got all the details next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Singapore's Tomasic is planning to invest $30 billion in the U.S. market over the next five years, with North America remaining its largest recipient of capital. The state-owned fund told Bloomberg it's also looking to invest in AI-related firms, plus semiconductor and infrastructure plays. Tomasic's investments for North and South America surpassed China this year for the first time in at least a decade. And regulators in the United Arab Emirates have made a historic step towards legalizing gambling by approving the nation's first lottery license. Casinos could soon become a reality in the UAE following this landmark decision. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Mideast economics reporter, Abid Abu Omar. Uh, sounds like it's a big step for the UAE. Tell us more about the decision. Yeah, Jermana, it is. So I think the key word here is regulation, right? So lottery, in some shapes, has existed in the UAE for a long time. Those are, you know, when you go to the supermarket, to the mall, the cars that, uh, you know, the luxury cars that you get or cash prizes. So it has existed. But what mm -hmm. happened now is the GCGRA, which is the regulator that the country started last year to regulate gaming in the country, has now facilitated lottery. So uh, at hindsight, a few months ago, they suspended some of the operators that were, uh, that didn't have licenses and now have given one single license to this company called The Game LLC. What we know of it is it's privately held, based mm -hmm in Abu Dhabi and it's going to be essentially all the lottery is going to go through this single um, entity. We don't know when it's going to start. We don't know what, you know, what, what the shape is going to, how the shape is going to take form. But we mm -hmm. know that the regulation has started to come into place and this is potentially sort of the first step into regulating casinos, which, yeah. you know, we haven't heard much about that. Yeah, well, uh, Zainab, our, our colleague on the BN side, has written a lot of stories about the future complexes that are being built in Ras Al Khaimah and, um, you know, some of them are casinos uh, and you wonder you know, to what extent these casinos can be successful without having a license in place. Is it fair to read that because this lottery license has been given that if this paves the way eventually to so casinos getting licenses as well? Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm just going to quote the chairman of the GCGRA, which is Jim Murren, who's ex-chairman um, for MGM, who said that this is the first pivotal moment for um, regulation for structuring this industry. Mm. So we know, obviously, the Wynn Resort that is supposed to open by 2027, that's cost mm. about $4 billion. Um, and we know that the CEO has said in previous calls that, you know, they're going to get licensed very soon. But just to be clear, as of now, 
gambling, gaming is still not legalized. Mm. It's going through the necessary approvals through this entity that is supposed to overlook uh, the entire regulation in the in the country. So we'll wait and see, but this is definitely the first step for us uh, to, to sort of read into, okay, something is happening. We might see a little bit more news trickling over the next few Yeah, and when does months. it actually get activated, the lottery license? So we don't know about mm. when the lottery um, license is going to get activated. It, but we know that you know they gave the the green light. They gave the first. Uh, they, they started this company. They have this mm. company that is going to give those uh, licenses. Yeah. Okay. So not quite what happens in Rasul Khaimah stays in Rasul Khaimah yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. <laughs> we'll keep a close eye on it. Abir, thank you very much for bringing us that story. Abir Abu Amar. All right. Before we head out, we've been talking about uh, the big market week that's coming up with all those central bank meetings. We've spoken extensively already on the show about Bank of Japan. The Fed, also Bank of England, haven't given it a lot of love, but that's coming on Thursday. Markets 50-50, penciling in for a rate cut there. And of course, we get earnings. Uh, today on the slate, we have the likes of Microsoft, AMD, Pfizer, and Starbucks all reporting. Over $27 trillion is reporting globally this week, $15 trillion in the S&P 500 alone. You can see futures are mostly pointing towards negative. Your futures up about a tenth. Uh, and that is it for our show. That was Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.